What's with these home? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chapter 5 of Unit 8 slash 9. This is AP World History. Mr. Ancharsky speaking. All right. So today we're going to look at kind of economic decolonization. Remember, Latin America has achieved its independence uh, basically by the 1830s for the most part. But today we're going to look at kind of how Latin America is going to transition from kind of being a center of informal imperialism and some struggles that are happening throughout the 20th century. But your bell work is on the screen, kind of comparing uh, the independence movements in India and Africa and East Asia, of course. So that's your bell work. Today is going to focus on Latin America in the 20th century. Lesson objectives today, you should be able to explain how political changes in the period from 1900 to the present led to territorial, demographic, and nationalist development. So pay attention to kind of when I use these words. Explain the economic changes and continuities resulting from the process of decolonization, in this case, economic decolonization. And then explain various reactions to existing power structures in the period after 1900. So today we're gonna to kind of break up Latin America. So time, kind of the time periods we'll break it up into is the 1900s to 1945. Then we'll look at 1945 to about the 1970s. And then we'll look at some general trends in Latin American history to the present day. But these are some general trends that will kind of influence what we'll talk about. We're gonna first look at Mexico, then we'll look briefly at Argentina and Brazil as well. But in terms of general trends in Latin American history, we have extreme instances of economic, racial, and political inequality. We have this economic division between landlords and largely peasants. Remember, many of the countries in Latin America, they are largely not industrialized by this point in the 20th century. We also have extreme amounts of racial inequality, especially between white Latin Americans, uh, people of indigenous descent. We also have Black uh, uh, Latin Americans as a result, the legacy of slavery that we talked about during colonial times, still going on to this day. We still have these racial inequalities, but they're especially apparent in the early 20th century as well. Kind of something that is an economic continuity is going to be this notion of informal imperialism or economic imperialism. It's similar to that idea of neocolonialism. We do have the influence of foreign companies in Latin American countries, particularly American ones and British ones. These countries, they own significant amounts of land. They own major infrastructure uh, like railroads and places across Latin America. So very much something that we will see is how Latin America will deal with the economic imperialism that is uh, promoted by countries like the United States, especially. And that's something that uh, we will see resistance to through a variety of means throughout this presentation. But another kind of general theme is this resistance to economic imperialism. We are going to see the rise of nationalist groups. They tend to um, uh, kind of be a mix between the right and left wing. On the one hand, we will have the rise of more uh, quasi-fascist groups, especially by the 1930s as a result of the Great Depression. But we're going to kind of see compromises with more radical kind of left-leaning ideas as well. So the Great Depression is going to be a major impact on Latin America, politically at least. We will see authoritarian leaders emerge who are going to try and create uh, industrial economies during a time of economic depression. And a few figures that are examples of nationalist populists, they could either be more left-leaning, they could be right-leaning. We have figures like um, uh, Card Cardenas in Mexico. He's going to emerge in the 1930s, as we'll talk about when we discuss uh, the party of institutionalized revolution. We'll talk about Getulio Vargas in Brazil. He's kind of an example of a more right-leaning quasi-fascist in Latin America. And we also have the figure of Juan Perón. Perón is kind of going to chart a course between 
right-wing fascism and more left-leaning socialism, as we're gonna see. So you should be able to identify some common trends in Latin American history in this initial period in the 20th century. And our first example is going to be Mexico, actually. Mexico, prior to 1910, has a lot of these examples of political inequalities, of economic inequalities, of racial inequalities. We have division between white and black, between white and Native American, white and indigenous people. We have economic inequality, especially in the rural countryside. A lot of landowners, both wealthy Mexicans and wealthy Americans, they own significant amounts of land across Mexico, especially in northern and southern Mexico. We have these huge haciendas, which are normally owned by wealthy whites in Mexico, both uh, Mexicans and also Americans who own this land. Who works the land? Largely, it's going to be the uh, people of mixed race descent, the so-called mestizos. It's not a great term but it means kind of people of mixed white and indigenous background. These tend to be rural and landless peasants. And kind of, we see all of these trends, especially during the presidency of this man with all these, uh, I almost called them buttons, with all these medals, President Horifio Diaz. Diaz is going to be a basically dictator in Mexican politics during the late 19th century. He is president, sure, but he holds a military dictatorship more or less. Sure, there's going to be a republic on paper, but all power is in the hands of this one dude. <coughs> and he's very much supporting these ideas of economic inequality. He's favoring these white landowners. He is favoring kind of a system that promotes inequality. On top of that, he's very friendly towards the Americans. He kind of lets American companies own up a lot of land in his country. But this kind of goes back to something we talked about in Unit 6, how a lot of wealthy elites in Latin America kind of welcomed American influence because Americans did invest in industry in Mexico. We are going to see a degree of economic development under Diaz. However, we are going to see this economic development largely favoring white uh, wealthy people in Mexico. Uh, Diaz is going to build up Mexico City as kind of a modern industrialized city. There are vast improvement product, uh, projects that are made, but it's mostly going to benefit again, the wealthy white class in Mexico. Under Diaz, we are going to see extreme amounts of poverty, especially in the countryside. We have um, kind of opposition towards his more Americanized, Europeanized uh, program of trying to make Mexico emulate traditions and uh, customs in Western Europe and in the United States. Again, kind of favoring this white wealthy class. We have land inequality, a vast amount of rural land is owned by these white wealthy people at the expense of uh, mixed race people, at the expense of Native Americans, at the expense of Afro uh, Mexicans. And we also basically have a dictatorship. There isn't really a guarantee for a right to vote, especially because of this quasi dictatorship that Diaz has. And the dictatorship of Diaz is going to lead to, well, calls for change. There is gonna be an election held in 1910, and it's a very controversial one. Diaz doesn't think he has any real kind of opposition. However, people are opposed to a dictatorship in general. So we are going to see this man right here, a guy by the name of Francisco Madero. He is going to run up against Diaz. And what do you know it? All of this anger against Diaz is going to result in Madero's victory. Madero is going to become, very briefly, the president of Mexico. However, Diaz isn't going to give up power that easily. He is going to imprison uh, Madero for quite some time. But this is going to cause a lot of anger, especially because Madero is seen as a democratizing figure. He wants to introduce a more liberal democracy one in which we have open representation and elections, free elections for everyday Mexicans. 
Eventually, Madero is going to be freed under pressure. Diaz is going to for be forced into exile. However, Madero is largely only interested in political reform. He's not interested in solving the crisis, the economic inequality in Mexico. So he's not going to be a very popular figure. And this is going to actually lead to calls to remove him from office. And we are going to see um, kind of support by wealthy Mexicans even to kind of uh, create a sense of stability. So we are going to see a very conservative uh, military force that is gonna try and oust Madero and they are gonna succeed. Madero is going to be overthrown by a general in the Mexican army, a guy by the name of Victoriano Huerta. Huerta is going to overthrow Madero, and eventually Madero is murdered. And Huerta is going to take power for himself. He is going to establish yet another military dictatorship. And this is going to cause a huge conflict in Mexico. We are going to see a civil war where we are seeing different factions, especially um, factions who are trying to create, on the one hand, a liberal style democracy, but also groups of people who want to create a more equitable economic system. So this is going to be a major civil war. And this is sometimes what we call the Mexican revolution. This is going to be a conflict between the dictatorship of Huerta against uh, kind of two different factions. On the one hand, we have the constitutionalists as we'll see in just a second. These are largely liberal, middle-class people, uh, more urbanites, uh, industrial workers as well. They tend to favor the constitutionalists. And on the other hand, we have the conventionalists. These are people who are largely in favor of land reform. These are largely Mexican peasants. And they are demanding a more equitable system to reduce the influence, the power of Mexican landlords. And we're gonna see who's in charge of these guys in just a second. Eventually Huerta is gonna be overthrown and then the constitutionalists and the conventionists, they're going to fight against each other because of their conflicting economic opinions. On the one hand, the constitutionalists more in favor of a liberal style of capitalism and the conventionists, they're more in favor of land redistribution. They want more economic equality that they think the constitutionalists aren't really doing anything to solve. The US is going to intervene in this civil war on, uh, at the start of everything. They're in favor of Huerta actually, but they tend to kind of lean more towards the constitutionalists as we're going to see. Uh, and of course, we are going to see with figures like Pancho Villa that we are going to see conventionists trying to reduce American influence in Mexico. They're actually going to invade places like Columbus, New Mexico, as we'll see. So this kind of chart right here shows us the different factions, the three major factions in the Mexican Revolution. On the one hand, we have the Huertistas, the followers of Victoriano Huerta or the federales, as they're sometimes called. They're in favor of conservatism. They're generally favored by the wealthy landowning classes, the, um, the major landowners in the countryside. And their kind of enemies at first are going to be the constitutionalists and the conventionists. Um, largely the Huertaistas, the the they're gonna be overthrown by 1914. And then the civil war is going to be really a struggle between these two right here. So at first, both of them are united against the conservative dictatorship of Huerta. Then they're going to turn on each other. The constitutionalists, led by guys like, uh, um, oh, I could pronounce it earlier, Venistano Carranza, Alvaro Obregón. These are going to be more liberal nationalists. They are in favor of a liberal democracy, one that favors the middle class and capitalism. They tend to also include uh, more kind of urban centers, as we'll see the constitutionalists more in favor of the concerns of uh, kind of liberal urbanites, uh, but also industrial workers that tend to uh, have similar concerns with these urbanites. 
eventually they are going to contrast with the conventionists. And we're going to talk about these two figures in just a second, Emiliano Zapata and Francisco Pancho Villa. These are people in favor of Mexican peasants. They're in favor of land redistribution. They want to break up the big estates in the Mexican countryside. Uh, they are going to be largely supported by rural peasants, and they are going to very much be against the, um, the dominance of these major, largely white landowners. They're also opposed to the United States' frequent intervention in Mexico. So uh, these figures, uh, especially Villa, are going to uh, try and attack the Americans. And the Americans, they're actually going to send troops in to northern Mexico. The Americans, they're going to uh, occupy Veracruz um, at, at some points during the Mexican Revolution to, quote unquote, defend American interests in Mexico. But the conventionalists are kind of the more um, radical wing of this Mexican Revolution. They include figures like Pancho Villa, Francisco Pancho Villa, and Emiliano Zapata. In northern Mexico, this is primarily Villa's base in the state of Chihuahua. We are going to see uh, Villa largely getting support from uh, northern Mexican peasants, largely from indigenous uh, Mexicans. And Villa is going to be in favor of breaking up these major haciendas in favor of more equitable land distribution. Zapata is also going to be a major figure advocating for land redistribution. He's a bit more radical um, than uh, Villa in a way because of his uh, kind of intense guerrilla campaign that he will wage against southern Mexican landlords. He's largely in the Mexican state of Morales. Zapata uh, is going to eventually be assassinated, as we'll talk about later on. Villa is also assassinated. But both of these figures are kind of more interested in creating um, their own kind of regional uh, bases, so to say. They're very much inspired by ideas of regionalism, as we recall from Unit 6, I believe, or Unit 5, I can't remember. This idea of kind of more association with your region rather than the nation as a whole. And kind of what makes the conventionalists not as successful as the constitutionalists, because the constitutionalists, they will win the Civil War. It's really this influence of regionalism. The constitutionalists, they have a national chain of support. That's why they will be successful in the Mexican Revolution. Whereas these regional cadillos, like Villa, like Zapata, they're kind of more fav in favor of retaining power in the countryside rather than having a cohesive national vision. So eventually we are going to see the constitutionalists win out. They have more broad uh, support across the nation of Mexico. They especially have more wealth than these regionalists. And they have greater access to supplies as a result. So the constitutionalists are going to win in the Mexican Revolution, and really what follows it, what follows the revolution, largely going to be inspired by what the constitutionalists believe in, as we'll see. So the constitutionalists are going to win the uh, kind of fight against Huerta uh, in 1914, and as uh, kind of after they take power, they're going to turn against the conventionalists. They are going to um, use the national army against these regional cadillos. We are going to see um, the new president, Carranza. He is going to use the Mexican military against these cadillos, especially Villa and Zapata. Zapata is going to be assassinated in 1920. Uh, by agents of the, uh, uh, of the federal army under Carranza. And we are also going to see um, uh, Villa eventually also being assassinated. However, when the constitutionalists take over, they are going to make a lot of changes, at least politically in Mexico, or at least make promises of change. And that's going to be especially embodied in the Constitution of 1917, a major result of the Mexican Revolution. It is going to be a document that tries to enshrine ideas of liberal democracy. We are going to see um, kind of 
of reaching out towards the concerns of poor people in the Mexican constitution. We are gonna see a guarantee of social welfare programs. We are gonna see promises to redistribute large land estates in the countryside, promises of universal education, wrest that away from the Catholic church in Mexico, the granting of universal suffrage, everyone can vote, especially landless peasants. And also there will be limits on the power of the president because really the president in Mexico has had a lot of power politically. Eventually we are gonna see the constitutionalists gain full control over Mexico. They defeat the conventionists, the regional cadillos like Villa, like uh, Zapata. They force Villa to surrender. Eventually he's assassinated and they kill, uh, they capture and kill Zapata as well. So we have a unified Mexico under this new liberal democratic regime. Eventually there are some lingering problems. There is a degree of political instability, especially kind of a lingering peasant resentment that this land redistribution didn't go far enough. And eventually Carranza actually is going to be uh, overthrown by his former ally, uh, Orbergron right here. Uh, we are going to see um, kind of lingering political tensions. There's still massive amounts of peasant poverty. Uh, Mexico is still largely not industrialized. We still have uh, American ownership over um, key infrastructure points across Mexico. So really there are lingering problems that as we're gonna see are intensified by the Great Depression. So to solidify power, the constitutionalists, they are going to uh, form a more kind of cohesive political unit, a political party known as the party of the institutionalized revolution. This is kind of a very nationalist party. It is one that kind of seeks to unite Mexico under a common uh, political vision, a common Mexican identity. It's not exactly left-leaning, it's not exactly right-leaning, but there are going to be kind of um, attempts for more equitable economic policies, and we're especially going to see that with the presidency of Lazaro Cárdenas in the 1930s. The Great Depression is going to intensify economic inequalities, and we're seeing the rise of a, um, a figure to, who, who wants to promote kind of socialistic uh, policies of welfare in Mexico. And that is going to be through kind of a change up of the constitution. Cardenas is going to uh, actually implement those reforms that were promised in the constitution of 1917. He is going to significantly reduce the power of the Catholic church in Mexico. He's reducing the influence of the military as well, especially as a political unit. He's going to uh, have the government own major um, industries like oil, um, taking it over from the Americans. And we're also going to see this promise of very generous social welfare programs. There is going to kind of, however, be a, um, not necessarily a dictatorship, but there is going to be essentially only one party really in charge of Mexico. We are going to see the PRI, as it's called in Spanish, largely dominate Mexican politics, uh, really until the 2000s, actually. And we are going to see uh, kind of lingering problems of poverty. Even though we have these more generous welfare programs, there still is poverty in rural Mexico. There still is racial inequality. So that is going to lead to the rise of kind of guerrilla groups that are inspired by the legacy of figures like Zapata. And one of these groups actually are the Zapatistas. These are uh, rural peasants who are demanding more um, economic equality, more uh, solutions to rural poverty in Mexico. So we're seeing kind of the rise of a nationalist figure like Cardenas, who's trying to unify Mexico through these generous welfare policies, not exactly going to adopt communism, but making it so Mexico is more equitable, 
And yet there still are lingering problems because these policies really kind of don't go far enough to solve problems of rural poverty. So what are some factors that led to the Mexican Revolution and what are some results? Think about kind of who comes to power, think about who, um, uh, excuse me, what political changes are being made and maybe think about what are some lingering problems in Mexico. We're gonna see similar nationalist developments in Brazil as well. Brazil is going to um, really experience similar problems that Mexico did prior to the Mexican revolution. We have wealthy landlords who dominate uh, the major plantations in Mexico, or excuse me, in Brazil. We are gonna see major landlords own the um, uh, major economic industries like the cocoa uh, industry, or the, the, the coffee growing industry, the cocoa growing industry, um, chocolate, the thing that you make chocolate out of. Anyway, so we have kind of the dominance of major landlords. But on top of this, we have lingering racial inequality as well. Remember, Brazil is one of the last countries in the world to formally end slavery. So Brazil has a lot of tensions, economically speaking and racially speaking. But we also have the major influence of foreign companies, of British companies, of American companies who own a lot of these major plantations, who own the railroads in Mexico. And really, Brazil is going to kind of be an export economy, really until the Great Depression. The Great Depression is going to majorly impact all export countries around the world. And this is going to kind of call for this is going to cause calls for change. And we're going to see that if the extreme right wing version of this with the figure of Getilio Vargas. Vargas was a, a military leader, but he's going to become president of Brazil. He is going to um, try and institute a form of uh, Brazilian fascism. And we're going to, and this is called Estado Novo in Portuguese, the new state. So Vargas is going to, uh, in order to solve the problems of the Great Depression in Brazil, in order to kind of create a system that benefits wealthy landowners and that solves some of these problems of social tensions, especially economic tensions, we see the rise of fascism in Brazil. We are going to see uh, largely fascism emerge to kind of uh, diminish the popularity of the Communist Party in Brazil, much like what we saw in Germany and Italy to a degree. So in order to kind of solve these economic tensions, we see the rise of an anti-communist government, but this anti-communist government is going to provide a lot of social welfare, especially in the urban centers of Mexico, uh, excuse me, of Brazil. So we are going to see a policy of social welfare under Vargas. We're also going to see Vargas really try and inspire and create an industrial economy. He is going to use a lot of state resources to rapidly industrialize Brazil. It is going to become kind of one of the other major industrial powers on the, in the Western Hemisphere, in the North or South American continents. Vargas is also going to take over or nationalize uh, foreign owned uh, companies, especially American companies in Brazil. He is an example of economic nationalism, but more of a kind of right wing variety. He is explicitly anti communist. However, lingering problems will remain, especially in the countryside. That's kind of something that unites all of these different nationalist figures is that these figures before 1945 largely ignoring the peasantry. They are more focused on industrialization. So the communist groups, left-leaning left groups, they're gonna be very popular among peasants across Latin America, as we'll see. But Vargas's nationalization program is going to be very influential for other nationalist uh, figures that will emerge across Latin American history, both on the right, and to, to a degree, the left as well. So he is a model for Latin American economic nationalism, especially if you are an anti-communist. 
And one of these figures that will be inspired by Vargas actually is going to be Juan Perón. But let's look at the kind of history of Argentina prior to Perón's rise. So much like Brazil, Argentina also has these problems of economic inequality. But we do have the rise of a major landowner class in Brazil, uh, in Argentina. Largely, this landowning class, they are going to benefit from economic development of the Pampas region in Argentina. This is largely going to be an area that kind of produces two things, wheat and meat. Uh, we do have a very strong Argentinian economy, but it's one that largely benefits white landowners in Argentina. Largely, the economic tensions are there in Argentina, much like we saw in Mexico, much like we saw in Brazil. There's going to also be a degree of racial tension. There's not a lot of people of African descent in Argentina, but there is racial tension between indigenous Argentines. There is tension between indigenous people and white Argentinians. There's also tension between native-born white Argentinians and immigrants, especially from places like Italy and Spain back in Europe. So we have a bunch of economic tensions that are going to be intensified as with Brazil during the Great Depression. And during the Great Depression, we will see the rise of several military dictatorships. These are dictatorships that are largely anti-communist. But even though while they're favoring these wealthy landowners, they're largely not going to do anything about rural poverty or about urban poverty at that matter. They are going to mostly focus on trying to industrialize Argentina to benefit these wealthy landowners. They are going to initiate a lot of urban revival products. They make Buenos Aires basically the Paris of Latin America. But it's in this kind of atmosphere of resentment against the military that we are going to see the rise of Juan Perón. Perón is a member of the military, but he's going to kind of lead a mass movement to establish a government that is going to try and solve concerns of economic inequality. Perón is going to form his own form of uh, politics known as Peronism. It's kind of a mix between left-leaning ideas and right-leaning ideas. Peron is an admirer of Mussolini, but he's also a bit of an admirer of FDR, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the United States and his programs of social welfare. So he is going to largely favor kind of white landowners, but he is going to have very generous welfare programs. He is what we call a populist authoritarian. He is doing things that are going to make a lot of people happy in these in cities and in the countryside, poor people in the cities and the countryside, through these very generous welfare programs. He's especially going to kind of gain support from Argentines, uh, from Argentinian peasants and uh, poor people in cities because of his association and the activism of his wife, Eva Duarte, Eva or Evita Perón. And Eva is going to be a major figure in Latin American history. She's kind of a cross between, uh, she's like if Michelle Obama, kind of a well-respected first lady, if she was more politically active, uh, especially in terms of economic policy, but also was married to quasi Mussolini. So she's going to be a major popular figure among poor Argentinians. And she's going to kind of push her husband to initiate a lot of social welfare programs. We are going to see very generous social welfare programs passed under Perón. Perón is an anti-communist, so he's kind of taking the wind out of the sails of the communist movement in Argentina. He is going to have uh, very generous pension programs. He is going to um, provide a lot of... Um, uh, so, not so, well, yes, social security, but kind of everyday guaranteed payments for men and women across Argentina. He's going to make inroads with solving gender inequalities as well. That's something that his wife is especially in favor for. Women get the right to vote under Peron. 
But Perón is also going to encourage that idea of economic nationalism by taking over foreign owned companies, especially British ones. So this is gonna cause a lot of antagonism between Argentina and Great Britain. But Perón is not a communist and that's why he's kind of allowed to do what he's doing in um, Argentina. Same thing with Vargas, he's not a communist, he can do what he wants in Brazil. Perón is eventually going to be deposed by the military, especially as he's starting to lean a bit more left-leaning, and especially after there is increased economic hardships. The cost of these welfare programs is draining Argentina's uh, treasury. Perón is not increasing taxes on wealthy landowners, so his treasury is going to evaporate. And this is going to lead to a lot of economic tensions, uh, especially as the welfare programs are starting to run dry, especially after Eva Perón dies at a really young age in 19, uh, uh, 1953, Perón's eventually overthrown, but he's going to come back to power in the 70s. We'll talk about that a bit later on. So how did the Great Depression impact Brazil and Argentina, and how are figures like Perón and Vargas changing their country's economies and political systems? But now we're going to look at how uh, Latin America will experience the Cold War. And let me tell you, it's going to be a tale of CIA intervention that you have not seen before. So what are some general themes? Well, to go to this idea of continuity, we are going to still see economic imperialism. We still see foreign-owned companies that largely dominate the economies of Latin America, especially in Central America, in places like Guatemala. We are going to see continued economic imperialism, especially by the United States during this time. And yet there are going to be alternative ways to kind of wrest control from the foreigners, to limit foreign presence in these Latin American economies. We're going to see this on the left and to a degree on the right as well, but mostly from left-leaning groups. But as a result of the rise of the Cold War, we are going to see more frequent intervention in Latin America, especially by the United States through various covert operations, especially through CIA intervention, as we'll see. There are going to be a series of proxy wars across Latin America, where we have communist groups that are backed up by, well, communist nations but also right-wing dictatorships, anti-communist dictatorships backed up by primarily the United States. But why specifically will the United States get involved so much in Latin America? Well, it's kind of the legacy of the Monroe Doctrine, going back to Unit 5. Remember the Monroe Doctrine explicitly said to European countries, hey, you cannot colonize Latin America. And kind of the quiet part of that was, because it's ours to economically control. So we are going to see frequent CIA intervention to protect American interests, especially as left-leaning governments sometimes come to power, as we'll definitely see. We are going to see also that notion of containment as well, influencing this frequent CIA intervention. We need to contain communism and prevent any successful communist revolution. And to their credit, they are going to be largely successful. There will only be one communist revolution that's successful. That's going to be in Cuba. And we'll talk about that more later on. But there are different ways that the Americans primarily are going to try and prevent the popularity of communism. We are going to see the creation of uh, kind of very generous American support for Latin American countries to build up their economies. So as to prevent the spread of communism, we're going to see that in the um, American Alliance for Progress. This is a collection of uh, Latin American states um, kind of to get together and discuss regional concerns. The United States is also a member. So we are going to see kind of um, this attempt to limit the spread of communism by generating strong economies in Latin American countries. But of course, kind of the most dramatic way we will see American intervention to prevent the spread of communism is through covert operations, through the CIA. 
but also we're going to see the Americans giving generous military aid to anti-communist groups across Latin America. And we're going to kind of see this notion of CIA intervention first being played out in Guatemala. Guatemala is going to be kind of the basis for which the CIA will frequently intervene in other Latin American countries. It's the model for how the United States will intervene as much as possible, because similar practices will be attempted or utilized across Latin America during the Cold War. But what happens in the Guatemalan coup? Well, in 1951, Guatemala is going to elect a socialist, a guy by the name of Jacobo Arbenz. Arbenz, he is a socialist. He's sympathetic to the Soviet Union, but not explicitly. But what is going to run the ire of the CIA of the United States? Well, in the 1950s, Arbenz is going to nationalize land that is owned by the United Fruit Company primarily. We are going to see the United Fruit really dominate Guatemalan politics prior to this and uh, the economy. About half of Guatemala's land belonged to foreign companies, and primarily the biggest one was the United Fruit Company. So in reaction to this nationalization program, but also in reaction to Arbenz's sympathies and diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union, this is going to make him a prime target for covert military operations. In 1954, under the direction of President Dwight Eisenhower, we are going to see the CIA train anti-communist guerrillas who are going to be successful in overthrowing the democratically elected uh, socialist presidency of Jacobo Arbenz. Arbenz is going to be um, I can't remember if he's exiled or executed, but he's going to be overthrown. And the military, which is largely anti-communist, is going to take over in Guatemala. So the CIA is going to allow for the creation of a right-wing military dictatorship. Really, it's going to be a series of these dictatorships because there will be frequent civil wars in Guatemala, especially as there are power struggles between the different military leaders. And kind of in the crossfire of all this, we are going to see a genocide occur against ethnically Mayan people in Guatemala, largely because the, these conservatives in the uh, Guatemalan military, they're largely influenced by ideas of white supremacy, but also because these rural peasants, they tended to support the policies of guys like Arbenz. They wanted to break up these mega foreign companies, these mega uh, companies that owned a lot of land so that there would be land reform. So these rural peasants, largely of Mayan descent, they tended to be more sympathetic to ideas of socialism and communism. So we are going to see a genocide occur under these various right-wing dictatorships. But the Guatemalan coup is especially important in Latin American history because it's a model for how the CIA will intervene frequently across Latin America during the Cold War. And this is going to be especially seen through kind of a few operations. One of them is going to be called uh, Operation Mongoose. All of them are named after animals for some reason. Operation Mongoose will be uh, how the CIA will try and overthrow the Cuban government, the socialist Cuban government, as we'll see. But another major uh, operation that the CIA will conduct is going to be Operation Condor in the 1960s through the 1980s. This is going to be a series of CIA supports for right-wing dictatorships, anti-communist dictatorships, and we'll talk about these dictatorships later on. And just to kind of underscore how uh, uh, the sympathies of the United States tended to be towards anti-communists, just a little bit of a coincidence. This is Jacobo Arbenz, the uh, socialist that was elected. This is the guy who replaces Arbenz uh, that is supported by the United States. It looks a little familiar, doesn't it? Uh, it's completely unintentional. He, he was an admirer of Charlie Chaplin, probably. So kind of what is similar to Latin American history prior to 1945 and after 1945? What can you notice? 
But let's look at another example of CIA, uh, excuse me, of how the military uh, support that the United States frequently gives to anti-communists is going to inspire movements for change. And let's look at the prime example of Cuba. Well, Cuba is going to get its independence from Spain pretty late in the, uh, in the, in the, ninth, in the 19th century. 19, excuse me, 1898, we have the uh, Mexican, or excuse me, the Spanish-American War. Cuba gets its independence. However, even after Cuban independence, the United States is going to frequently intervene in Cuba, especially to protect American companies that own a lot of sugar plantations in Cuba, especially uh, to protect American interests uh, like, well, the ownership of certain casinos in Havana. These casinos were owned by good old American businessmen, uh, otherwise known as the American Mafia. Uh, if you've seen The Godfather Part Two, this is kind of this atmosphere in Cuba. Uh, the United States wanted to support this because of these American investments in Cuba. And that's going to be a trend really throughout the early 20th century. And it's going to end after it's going to end after the dictatorship of this guy right here, Florencio Batista. Batista was a pro American, pro capitalist dictator. Uh, that is going to encourage American, further American investment. He's making promises to the United States. I'm not going to interfere with American businesses in Cuba. In exchange, you're going to give me all your political support. You will send me all your military aid. And, you know, we'll take a cut of all of this business that we're supporting uh, in Cuba. Batista is an absolute dictator. He is going to very much be a brutal tyrant that's backed up by the United States. He's encouraging all of this wealth inequality. There is this huge wealth gap in Cuba, not only in the countryside, but in cities as well. So urban workers are extremely poor. We have rural peasants who largely don't have any shoes, who are illiterate, because all of this money is going towards economic development that's benefiting only white, wealthy Cubans. It's all backed up by the United States. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of anti-American sentiment among people demanding for a more equitable economic system. And this is going to fuel underground resistance, largely uh, kind of more legitimate political means for change. They are gonna be uh, stamped down. Batista will regularly cancel elections. So really, you can't vote these people out of office. So this is going to inspire more radical militant demands for change. We are going to see an emerging underground resistance. And this is going to lead to the Cuban Revolution. This is about a uh, kind of seven-year-long struggle between underground guerrillas who are largely of the kind of socialist persuasion, who are going to wage an underground war against Batista's dictatorship. And the two figures that emerge in the Cuban revolution are going to be these two guys. Fidel Castro, he was a middle-class lawyer who is going to very much kind of feel for the plight of Cuban peasants. He's going to feel for the plight of uh, Cuban of Afro Cubans of uh, Cubans of African descent, and he's also kind of more sympathetic towards ideas of left leaning nationalism. He wants to remove the American influence, and he wants to create a more equitable society economically. But more importantly, for world history, actually, is going to be this figure right here, and you might recognize him. This is Ernesto Che Guevara. Uh, che is kind of his nickname, and sometimes we know him as Che Guevara. Che Guevara is actually from Argentina, and he's got he, and he got his kind of political um, uh, experience, so to say, his political views, resisting the dictatorship of Juan Perón. He saw how Perón benefited the right wing of Argentina by kind of favoring these wealthy white landowners. And he's going to get involved in a series of protests in Argentina, but he's going to leave Argentina as kind of a political exile to a degree. He goes to Mexico, he meets up with Fidel Castro, who's also exiled from Cuba, and he is going to train 
exiled Cubans to lead a revolution against Batista. Guevara is going to not only be instrumental in the Cuban revolution towards the eventual success of these underground revolutionaries, but he's also going to try and spread revolution across Latin America, as we'll see later on, uh, and in Africa as well. Uh, Fidel Castro and Guevara, they lead the, their kind of movement is called the July 26th movement. It's named after a, a victory that these rebels have against Batista that takes place on, well, you guessed it, July 26th, uh, after they attack the Moncada barracks in the east of Cuba. But given this kind of atmosphere of such hostility towards Batista and the successes of Castro and Guevara in their guerrilla campaign against Batista, they're going to win. There's going to be massive strikes in the cities that are organized by the July 26 movement. And there's going to be kind of a breakdown of the social order. The Batista government is losing militarily. They're losing control of the cities through these mass strikes. And eventually, by July, or excuse me, by December 31st, 1959, Batista is going to flee Cuba. And we are going to see a new government come to power. Eventually, who is going to lead this government? It's going to be Fidel Castro. Batista flees Cuba. He takes with him something like $900 million worth of money from the Cuban treasury. But Castro is going to get straight to work trying to create a socialist society, at least a more equitable economic system. So Castro is going to initiate a program of Cuban nationalism, of Cuban uh, left-leaning nationalism. Uh, it is going to be one that kicks out the American presence. We are going to see land redistribution. Peasants get their own property, nationalizing major industries, encouraging industrialization, collectivizing farms. They're going to see the promotion of schools across Cuba. Literacy rates are going to go through the roof. We are going to see um, very successful advances in medicine as well under Castro. However, all of this is going to come at the expense of a lot of political freedom. At first, it is going to largely be directed against Batista's uh, former allies. We are going to see mass execution of Batista's supporters. Um, well, not that mass execution. Actually, more people are killed under Batista when he came to power than when Castro killed, uh, came to power, but that's a different thing. So there is political repression, there is censorship, there is going to be um, the jailing of political opponents. And really, uh, uh, there will be kind of um, uh, disastrous economic policies, especially because of how uh, haphazard all of this imposition of socialism is going to be. However, even though there will be struggles to kind of create a stable Cuban economy, we are going to see a successful socialist revolution in Latin America, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. And this is extremely worrisome for the United States. The United States wants to reclaim all of this economic development, all of this major ownership that Castro just took away. So we are going to see frequent CIA intervention. In 1961, the CIA is going to train right-wing Cuban exiles to invade Cuba in the so-called Bay of Pigs invasion. It's an absolute L for the United States. These uh, Bay of Pigs invaders, they're going to be uh, jailed by Castro. And eventually, uh, the United States is forced to kind of pay ransom for these jailed exiles. The CIA is going to frequently try and kill Castro. Um, the CIA will admit to eight of these assassination programs. But Fidel Castro's bodyguards, they estimate that there were over 600 attempts on his life. These uh, assassinations are really wacky to a degree. Some of them include like exploding cigars. Some of them include anti-beard growing pills to kind of lose the machismo of, of Fidel Castro. It's very, uh, if it wasn't kind of so brutal against everyday Cubans as well, there will be terrorist attacks against everyday Cubans. If it wasn't so terrible against everyday Cubans, it'd almost be hilarious with all of these kind of anti-beard pills, for God's sake. 
And the Americans are also going to have an embargo on Cuba. No one can buy anything produced by the Cubans. So Cuba, kind of alone in the world, is going to appeal towards the natural uh, enemy of the United States, the Soviet Union. They have a close military alliance. And this is going to lead to things like the, uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as we've discussed before. Yet there are very much going to be uh, successes under the Cuban government. Uh, the Cuban uh, government is going to encourage advances in medicine. Uh, really, these are things that are verified from international organizations. It's not just Cuban um, propaganda. For instance, Cuba is going to eliminate uh, mother to child HIV transfer. They are going to develop their own COVID vaccines uh, in like this atmosphere of an embargo. That's something that's more of a modern development, of course. However, the Cuban revolution is important because of these two reasons right here. For one thing, the Cuban government will be very much active in promoting worldwide communist guerrilla movements. They are kind of like what Mao was doing uh, in promoting communist guerrilla movements. We are going to see Che Guevara eventually leave Cuba to try and inspire revolutions across Latin America, but also in Africa as well. But the other impact is going to be the increased U.S. support for any anti-communist government in Latin America, no matter how brutal, as we're going to see in just a second. So watch this video kind of to uh, describe the legacy of Che Guevara and his contrasting image. On the one hand, he is leading to the rise of the Cuban uh, dictatorship under Castro. But on the other hand, we do have a kind of movement for more equitable economic systems in the world that he's inspiring. But kind of as a legacy of the Cuban revolution, we are going to see frequent CIA interventions against any communist movement across Latin America, leading to very brutal results. And these are just examples of what South America will look like throughout the 1970s. Brazil is going to see a military dictatorship. We are going to see the pioneering of the so-called Brazilian solution. This is essentially how do we get rid of communist guerrilla movements? Well, we have a very brutal dictatorship that will basically impose a degree of fascism that is going to arbitrarily arrest anyone suspected of communist sympathies. We are going to see mass political repression. And as a result, we are seeing kind of uh, people being very uh, resentful of the Brazilian military dictatorship. There is more sympathy for socialism, especially among the poorest of the poor in Brazil. Bolivia is also going to have a right-wing dictatorship. They're going to be very brutal in trying to root out communist uh, guerrilla movements, communist parties. Che Guevara actually goes to Bolivia. And the CIA is going to sponsor kind of a, a mass repression of the Bolivian people to try and root out Che Guevara. Eventually, they're successful, and the CIA will murder uh, Che Guevara by 1968, causing plenty of damage in the process. Argentina is going to see an extremely brutal repression of communist groups in the so-called Dirty War. We are going to see a right-wing dictatorship emerge, especially after Juan Perón dies, and his kind of uh, sympathy towards left-leaning ideas is going to uh, come into question. We are going to see communist groups being suppressed very brutally. People are, quote-unquote, disappeared and arrested and killed with no trial. Sometimes they are flown over the... Uh, the uh, Atlantic Ocean and helicopters and thrown into the sea, even if they're vaguely left-leaning, supporting any of these ideas. Uh, the Catholic Church is going to actually kind of uh, implicitly support this military dictatorship, including uh, allegedly the current uh, Pope uh, when he was uh, a little cardinal back in Argentina. But uh, that's, uh, anyway. In Chile, we're going to see a very similar kind of CIA promotion of anti-communist uh, political groups, especially after the election of Salvador Allende in 1973. In 1973, a socialist comes to power. He is going to nationalize 
Chilean mines that are owned largely by American companies. But he's going to be overthrown in a CIA-sponsored coup. Who comes to power? Well, it's going to be a pro-capitalist dictator, Augusto Pinochet. Pinochet is as brutal as they come. He is going to also kind of disappear people, throw them into uh, prison camps in the middle of Chilean deserts, and brutally massacre people. Uh, he's also going to do this uh, helicopter uh, program of throwing out socialists into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Nicaragua is also going to see um, how the Americans will support anti-communist groups, very brutal ones. In the 1970s, we see the election of the Sandinistas. These are socialist, this is a socialist coalition that comes to power. And they're also going to support kind of left-leaning programs. But instead, uh, excuse me, we are going to see the U.S. kind of sponsoring an anti-socialist movement, the so-called Contras. The Contras are extremely brutal in their uh, guerrilla fight against the Sandinistas. They are going to have what we call death squads that regularly go into peasant villages and kill any suspected supporters of the communist, of the socialist government. Um, the death squads, the Contras, they're also going to smuggle cocaine uh, to fuel their, uh, their anti-communist activities. This cocaine largely bought up by the CIA. Uh, coincidentally, there's a cocaine epidemic in the 1980s in the United States. I wonder where they got that cocaine from. Um, yeah, never mind. Um, so yeah, we have this kind of very brutal civil war uh, in Nicaragua. And who supports the anti-communists? It's the United States. The Contras absolutely going to kill as many Nicaraguans suspected of being pro-socialist as much as possible. So you should be able to kind of describe how the Cold War impacted Latin American politics. Well, let's look at some trends in the modern day. Well, kind of an overall trend, even to this day, is that we are going to see the fall of these military dictatorships. We are going to see a general kind of movement towards democracy in the 1970s and the 1980s. These military dictatorships, they are going to kind of be forced by internal pressure and uh, to a degree, this language of human rights that's starting to pop up in the 1980s for a more equitable uh, political system, one that allows for free elections, especially as the communist threat is largely going to be massacred. So there's really no reason in the minds of middle class people to have this brutal dictatorship anymore. So by the 1980s, we are going to see a expansion of liberal democracies in Argentina, in Brazil, in Peru, Guatemala, Panama, Nicaragua. And yet there are gonna be lingering political difficulties as well. We do have kind of remaining right-wing anti-communists uh, that do exist across these Latin American countries. We are also going to see lingering communist guerrilla movements. We have the FARC in Colombia. We have the, Zapati the Zapatistas in Mexico who are going to advocate for a violent overthrow of these um, of these capitalist democracies across these countries. And these countries, excuse me, these uh, political movements are largely going to be involved in the drug trade business to encourage their own finances. But we're also going to see a wave of democratic movements towards socialism, the so-called pink tide. We are gonna see variety of governments across Latin America elect more socialist leaning people, not as kind of um, uh, communist as Castro, but we will see the rise of figures like Evo Morales in Bolivia. We will see Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. He comes to, to power in more kind of uh, military kind of over overthrow sort of means, but he still is more sympathetic towards ideas of socialism. In Brazil, we have Silvio Lula who comes to power and He's actually kind of still a major figure in Brazilian politics, even to this day. Um, in the 19, in the, excuse me, in the early 2000s, we kind of see a rise of conservatism, but these conservatives largely don't solve 
uh, economic inequalities that emerged during the 2008 financial crisis. So in the 2010s and even to this present day, we are still seeing the rise of socialist political parties that are elected through democratic means. And the Cold War is over. That means the CIA, I'm smirking a little bit, isn't going to kind of openly be um, able to overthrow these democratically elected governments. We still see economic problems. There still is economic inequality, especially among rural po uh, populations, especially as a result of the rise of industrialization. There are still amounts of urban poverty, especially as urban centers are greatly expanding, as we're going to see in a second. There's still going to be problems of inflation. Uh, you might have heard kind of in the news about Venezuela and those problems of in uh, inflation, kind of the lingering legacy of neo-colonialism. Uh, we have dependency on world bank loans of these pro kind of capitalist developments that are indebting Latin American countries to stronger industrial economies like the United States, like countries in Western Europe, and like China to a degree. And yet to kind of create a uh, economic independence for Latin America, we are going to see economic unions being promoted. These fair trade, or excuse me, free trade organizations that are trying to encourage uh, the rise of world trade in Latin America to encourage economic development. We have the creation of economic unions like uh, Mercosur or the Southern Common Market across Latin America. We have NAFTA between the United States and Mexico and Canada uh, that was only pretty recently replaced by uh, whatever the heck Trump did. Um, I don't remember the name of what Trump's uh, new NAFTA was. But anyway, we have these economic unions that are emerging to encourage and, and economic industrial uh, development. But kind of also a lingering uh, changes in Latin America, we are gonna still see um, kind of problems of racial inequality. We will see very vibrant cultures that have a mix of different influences, of African influences, of indigenous influences, of European influences. We're going to generally see uh, the kind of lingering religious conservatism in Latin America, primarily towards the Catholic Church. Um, we do see generally a rise of Protestantism, especially with the growth of um, kind of capitalist development uh, across Latin America, especially in Brazil. There's going to be a, a fairly significant Protestant population. But there is going to be the emergence of a kind of more social justice oriented form of Catholicism known as liberation theology, the idea of creating a more equitable society based off more left leaning religious principles, the idea of everyone being equal in the eyes of our brother, uh, Jesus Christ. There are kind of movements and debates about gender equality that are largely coming up against this social conservatism that lingers in Latin America, but there will be movements for gender uh, equality. Women will be given the right to vote across the, 19, uh, across the 1900s. Uh, so it's earlier in some places and it's a bit delayed in other places. There's going to be increasing immigration as well, largely as a result of political instability. These immigrants, where are they going to go? Well, to stronger, more stable political environments like the United States. So we are going to see an uptick in the 1960s, even to the present day, of immigrants coming to the United States, for example. But on the other hand, we see internal migration as well. We're going to see rapid industrialization. That's leading to rapid urbanization. We are going to see places like Mexico City become a mega, uh, mega, uh, megapolis. The mega city will emerge across Latin America. Mexico City is the largest city on the North American continent in the Western Hemisphere. Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, a huge city, uh, millions of people. Um, but there are problems of poverty in these places. There will be slums or favelas, as they're known in Rio de Janeiro, that are largely going to see these problems of economic inequality, of racial inequality as well. So there are lingering problems of inequality, both in the economic sense 
but also in the racial equality sense. So you should be able to identify some cultural, economic, and political shifts in Latin America in the late 20th century. And you should also be able to consider how the experiences of Asia and Africa are similar to Latin America during this time period. So there are a few uh, videos that you can watch. This one's a bit longer. It is about the Mexican Revolution, which I unfortunately can't go into that much detail. Extremely fascinating event. But then we also have another video that kind of narrates Cuban and American relations as well. Thank you for watching. I was very fascinated by all this stuff, a few of it uh, I was not familiar with, especially the Mexican Revolution. So thank you for watching. Have a great day, uh, my guys and gals, non-binary pals. Uh, I had a song stuck in my head, but I can't remember it. I try being with the habit of people of